Good morning and welcome. Special welcome to the folks who are watching at home. It's good for us to be together for worship. Some announcements as we begin. A reminder that committee night is this Thursday at 7. We meet in the church basement for a short devotion and then break to do committee work. Even if you're not on a committee, we'd invite you to join us and we'll find a place to plug in and put you to work. Please remember that we turn to our regular Sunday schedule next week. Sunday school will begin at 8.30. Worship begins at 9.45. Confirmation will also resume uh, Sunday, starting with a parent meeting here in the sanctuary. St. John will be again supporting a sack for a sack this year. Every time Genoa sacks the opposing team's quarterback, St. John donates a bag of groceries to the Genoa Food Pantry. If you would like to contribute, the donation is $25 per sack. The September newsletter is now available for download from the church website. You can also pick up a copy here at the church, uh, inside over here by the bulletins up front and outside in the realtor box near the church office. A few years ago, the, office, or the post office changed how they process bulk mailings and newsletters had to be mailed first class. So we try to send out fewer to save money, but we do still mail newsletters from the church office. If you would prefer to receive a forerunner by uh, USPS mail, please contact the church office to be added to that list. Our faith practice reading this past week was from Psalm 73. Shane said that my Kit Kats were getting stale, so now we have peanut butter ghosts, and they're fresh. I don't know that they were stale, but I think he just wanted the rest of the Kit Kats, so I, we'll see. So you can have a, a maybe stale Kit Kat and a peanut butter ghost if you get this right. They're sitting up here. So Psalm 73, the psalmist in verse 2 writes, My feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. What was tripping him up? That was verse 3. Anyone get that? That's why my candy's getting stale. Melissa, maybe. Um, when I was foolish? No. Verse 3, I was envious. envious. Envious of the arrogant and saw the prosperity of the wicked. Very good. So two candy bars to choose from right up here. And our readings each week are sequential. So this coming week will be in Psalm 74. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for worship.
Will you please stand for the confession and forgiveness? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us. Gracious Lord.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. And finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First reading is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I have, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursings. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live long, live loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord your swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Athea, our sister, to Acropolis, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and for your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now as a prisoner of Christ. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, 
no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I am writing to you, knowing that you may do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to assume that most of us don't steal. We don't take things that don't belong to us. But why? Why don't you steal? When I was in seminary, I worked as a counselor at Camp Moana one summer. I asked a group of junior high age campers that question. Why don't you steal? One popular answer was, I'm afraid of getting caught. If you were wandering around the parking lot of Walmart, swiping things out of unlocked cars, the police were going to get involved when you get caught. You would be searched, handcuffed, hauled away. You would most likely have to go to court, depending on the value of the stolen items, prior criminal record, etc., you could receive jail time. So one answer was fear, fear of the consequences of breaking the law. The campers also talked about shame and embarrassment of having a criminal record, or the wrath they would face at home from parents. One young man said, if I was caught stealing, my family would be extremely disappointed. My mom would probably cry. I'm sure most of my friends wouldn't want to hang out with me anymore. A criminal record could cause problems getting into college or getting a job. What employer would want to hire a thief? All excellent points. He ruled out stealing because he wanted to avoid shame and embarrassment. No one wants people to point at them and whisper or hide their wallets or their purse when you walk into a room. Why don't you steal? It took a while, but I finally got the answer I was waiting for. I don't steal because it's wrong. You simply shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. You can try to justify it any way you want, but stealing is just plain wrong. Even if you can get away with it, even if your parents never find out, even if you never spend a minute in jail, 
stealing is still wrong. Now, it's interesting to note that with each of these answers, the desired behavior is achieved. That is, the young men and women are not involved in theft. The difference is in the motive, or the why. The motive is what distinguishes the responses. Now, hold on to that. We'll come back to motive later. First, I want to talk about our second lesson. Onesimus was a runaway slave. Just like in the movies, he was a hunted fugitive whose life was in constant danger. As a man on the run, Onesimus had two options. He could spend his days hiding in the dark, grimy alleys of a Roman city, dodging soldiers and bounty hunters, or he could return to his master. Now, we need to remember that the laws of the Roman Empire were harsh. If a runaway slave did return, his master had the legal right to sentence him to immediate execution. If the master was merciful and decided to let him live, the slave could have the letter F for fugitive seared on his forehead with a branding iron, marking him for life. So, life on the run, or corporal punishment, and the possibility of death. Faced with such limited possibilities, Onesimus chose to run. He fled to Rome, probably using money stolen from his master, Philemon. And here's where things get complicated. When he was in Rome, Onesimus converted to Christianity. He met the imprisoned Paul and told him his story of being a fugitive. He still had the same options, keep running or turn himself in, but now he had to factor in the teachings of Jesus and striving to do what is right. Onesimus, a runaway slave, and Paul, a prisoner, we can only imagine the conversations these two had. But in the end, Onesimus felt obligated to return. He knew it was the right thing to do. And the fact that the young man had proven himself very useful to Paul made it even harder for the two of them to part, knowing that his life hung in the balance. Paul, therefore, found in the situation an opportunity for the mutual exercise of Christian love. With Onesimus, he sent a letter appealing to Philemon to show how a Christian should treat a runaway slave. Paul hoped Philemon would accept Onesimus not only as a returned slave, but as a fellow Christian. Our second lesson today is this letter to the slave owner Philemon. In it, Paul appeals to Philemon's friendship, his status as a Christian leader, his sense of love and compassion. Paul reminds him that faithfulness to Jesus means recognizing all of his followers are equal partners in the gift of God's love and grace. He builds a strong case for receiving Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. But what Paul doesn't do is order Philemon to consent. Now, we can assume Paul had the power. He was an apostle and one of the founders of Philemon's church, yet he makes no demands. Paul lays it on pretty thick, reminding Philemon about you owing me even your own self, but he doesn't give mandates. He appeals to Philemon's duty as a fellow Christian, as a leader in the church. He speaks of love and compassion. He describes what he believes is the appropriate thing to do, but he doesn't force or command Philemon to act in a particular way. After reading the letter, Philemon is free to make his own choice. Which is a nice reminder that God doesn't force our choices either. Through the Spirit, we are called to be children of God. That's always first, the Spirit's call. But what we do with that invitation 
is up to us. Jesus presents a case as to why we should serve God and strive for righteousness, but he doesn't make demands that we do. The Bible is full of accounts of the wonderful things God has done for his people, and the Bible is specific about how God wants his followers to live, but we're free to turn away. God applies pressure, reminding us that we owe him even our own lives, but there's no mandate. God appeals to our sense of duty, speaks of love and compassion. God gives us a model in Jesus for how to do the right thing. God gives us the very essence of love and compassion, but God doesn't force us to act in a particular way. Actually, God knows we might not act in a particular way. Even so, he gave us his Son, so that through him we might have life. Despite our lack of worthiness, we are given grace and forgiveness. God acts first, we are free to make a choice. Now, that's not to say there aren't consequences for actions or inactions, but love always comes first, and our choice is not forced. God simply makes a case, loves us, yearns for us to be with him, but we're free to choose what to do with that invitation to the party. And we are free to choose for our own reasons. See, I told you we'd come back to motives. There are some people who believe in God out of fear, just like the kids being afraid of getting busted by the cops. They are certain that if they don't believe or if they don't behave a particular way, God is going to strike them down. The fear of hell is enough to get some people to church on a regular basis. Flipping through the television channels late at night, you can find plenty of TV preachers who seem to be trying to frighten people into faith. Instead of preaching the gospel, they tell of all the horrible things that are going to happen to the sinners. So their motive is fear. There are also people who choose to follow God because of what it will do for them. Perhaps they think being seen as a Christian gives them the image they desire. Or they want to take advantage of church programs or use God to pray and grow rich. For whatever reason their motives are self-serving. But thankfully, there are those who choose to follow because Christ's love makes the world beautiful, and it's the right thing to do. They hear the message of God's love and grace. They hear the message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and they know the power of love and forgiveness in their own lives and they realize that striving to love God and love their neighbor is the right thing to do. There are people who recognize the depth of their brokenness, and they're overwhelmed with what God has done in their lives and respond with thanks and praise. Not because of fear, not because of image, not because of what they can get, but because of love. Because Jesus' message rings true. They follow simply because it's the right thing to do. Now we may ask, why do we need to worry about motive as long as a person is doing the right thing? Does the why matter when you achieve the desired results? Maybe if our goal were only to keep teenagers from stealing stuff, but in the case of following God, choosing how to live our lives, choosing to love one another, motive is important. If Onesimus was accepted back as a fellow Christian, well, that's good news for him, regardless of the motive. But if Philemon accepts him out of fear for what Paul could do to him, He's not really acting as Christ would want him to, is he? He's not really recognizing all of Jesus' followers as equal partners who share in the gift of God's grace and love. 
he's acting out of coercion instead of faith. So what kind of life would Philemon live? What kind of Christian witness would he be if he were afraid of Paul and afraid of God? When we live a certain way or do certain things out of fear or pride, the focus is on us. If fear is our motive, then our actions are determined by what's best for us. If we go to church because we think God will somehow punish us if we don't, that's self-preservation, not worship. Granted, we're still in church, but acting out of selfishness is contrary to the gospel. We are called to care for our brothers and sisters, to serve our neighbors, to be kind, merciful, and humble, not because we get something out of it or earn special favor with God, but because it's the right thing to do. We come to worship and celebrate, not because we have to punch a ticket in order to get into heaven, but because God has given us an incredible gift, amazing blessings, and giving thanks is the right thing to do. Part of being a Christian is having a focus that's outside of ourselves, on our neighbors, our community, and the world. Following Jesus is necessarily selfless. And just as Paul doesn't threaten Philemon, Jesus doesn't threaten us. Jesus doesn't say, follow me or else, but instead gives us a choice. And as we look at our faith and our relationship with God, we discover motive is important. Following Jesus is not something we should do for selfish reasons. It's something we do simply because God is good. Jesus' love is beautiful, and that beauty can change the world for the better. And striving to follow Jesus and share that goodness is the right thing to do. Amen.
Together, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need and all of God's good creation. Most holy God, we pray for the church around the world and for the mission of the gospel. Refresh the hearts of your people, deepen our understanding of every good thing we share, and strengthen our partnerships in faith. God of grace, hear our prayer. For the well-being of the earth and all its creatures, for trees and forests, for all that will yield fruit this season, and for streams and other bodies of water. God of grace, hear our prayer. For the nations and those in authority, for the elected leaders of our towns, states, and country, and for international organizations. Grant wisdom to those who govern, and raise up citizens who make decisions in the best interest of their neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. For all in need, for those who suffer from disease, who struggle with homelessness or food insecurity, for those whose family life is difficult, and for all in this community who need your care. We pray especially for Anne, Carol, Linda, Diane, and all of those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. For this community of faith, for all our labors, begun, continued, and ended in you, that they glorify your holy name. Bless your people with the strength to live into their many vocations for the sake of the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who now rest from their labors. Give us faith like them to love you with all our hearts, and by your mercy bring us to everlasting life. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gather together into the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. We're not passing the offering plates, but we still take time to mark giving as a faithful response to God's word received in worship. We remember that it is our faith rather than culture that determines our approach to money, wealth, and generosity. Jesus tells us where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore, with our heart and our treasure, we give to God's work in and through this place as a sign of thanksgiving and faith. Let us join together in our offering prayer. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need. Through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen.
please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Let us pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. beside you. Thanks be to God.